Now, at first the title of my message was Put God First. But something about it was bothering me and this morning I thought, no, I'm gonna change it to Keeping God First. You know why? How many times do we decide to put God first, <laughs> but then the keeping Him first becomes an issue because in case you haven't noticed, the world is full of things to distract us. Yeah. I'm sure you've experienced, you make a decision that you're going to pray every morning and study the Word before you do anything else, and man, all of a sudden it's nighttime and you don't even know what happened, but that plan you made didn't work out. And so, more than anything, and I want you to listen to me, more than anything, the devil will fight you about keeping God first in your time, in your finances, and in many, many, many different ways. And so I feel like the Lord wants me to talk to you this morning about keeping God first. And for some of you, it may require making some adjustments. You see, here's the thing that you don't want to do. I found myself many years ago trying so hard to work God into my schedule. And finally one day the Lord said, why don't you just work your schedule around me? So are you trying to find a place to put God into your schedule? <laughs> or would you be willing today to say, God, from now on, you're going to be first, and I don't care what else has to go. I don't care what else has to go or what I have to change, what I have to make an adjustment in. I want to keep you first in my life in everything. Let me tell you, being a Christian just does not work out right if God is a sideline in your life. And I, you know, that's probably not the case with a lot of you because you wouldn't have taken the trouble to come out here on a Saturday morning. But I'm not just talking to you today, we're talking to millions of people all over the world through this wonderful technology today that we have called television. And I'm well aware that there are people who think you accidentally turned the program on, but it could be a life-changing moment for you today. There are also probably millions of people that I refer to, like I used to refer to myself, as a religious person. Well, Jesus didn't die so we could have a religion. He died so we could have a deep, intimate, personal relationship with Him through Christ. We need to learn how to do life with God. He doesn't want to just be part of your Sunday morning. He wants to be welcomed into and be a vital part of everything that you do. Hmm. Okay then. Millions of people believe in Jesus and go to church on Sunday. But God is not first in their life. And I want to tell you that he is a jealous God. <laughs> He's jealous of you. He puts you first in his life. Do you know that? Every single one of you is first in God's thoughts. You say, well, how could we all be first? Because God is God. And he can do that. And so everything I'm saying today is not just to a bunch of people. It's to individuals and once Jesus died on the cross and ascended on high, he sent the Holy Spirit who can be everywhere all the time with every person. So God is omnipresent. He's here today, but he's also in China and Africa and India and Asia. And, and he can speak something different to every one of you all at the same time. People will come to these conferences and tell me things they got out of it, and I don't even remember saying that. But see, God can speak to you. And I want you to understand this today. You are on God's mind all the time. You are on God's mind all the time. He's always thinking about you. We could not even count the thoughts that God has toward us. They would be like little grains of sand on the beach. Before you ever arrived on planet Earth, God made a plan for every single day of your life. He won't force you to walk in it, but he would like you to walk in it. 
He would like to guide you and lead you through life. And literally, let me say it again, be involved in everything you do, in every decision you make, God wants to be part of it. That's what Jesus died for us to have. Not just believe a certain doctrine, join a certain group, and go to church once a week, and hope we go to heaven when we die. That's pretty sad if that's all being a Christian means to us. So I wanna to talk to you for a moment about the importance of remembering the things that God has done for you. There's some great warnings in the Bible about the dangers of forgetting God. And really exactly what's wrong with our nation right now it's not a money problem, it's a moral problem. If the morals are right, the money will be there. And I don't care how many panels of experts they put together to study the problems, they are not gonna find the answers because the answer is simply repent of your sins and return to God. And to be honest, in most of our lives, that's the bottom line answer. Quit trying to do what you want to do and start doing what I'm asking you to do. America was built on the foundational principles of the Word of God. All of our laws are built on the Word of God. And you cannot remove God from a nation that was built on God and expect the nation to last and to work. Israel did that over and over and over and over. And God is gracious and he always received them back, but they would do the same dumb thing again and again. And every time they did, they had war, they had famine, they had all kinds of problems in their life. I don't know why anybody would not be able to see what is going on. And I think one of the things we need to pray is that the, that the blind will see and the deaf will hear. And I'm not talking physically, I'm talking about the blindness that's on our leaders that prevents them from seeing what the real problem is. All you have to do is look back to when they took the 10 commandments off the walls in the schools. And it's been a... <laughs> well, you know, we can all sit and say, well, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. Well, you know, we're not responsible for what everybody does. What we are responsible for what we do. Amen. Amen. I read this morning about a group of mothers. I can't remember exactly where it was, so I won't tell it wrong, but they started a Jesus lunch off campus in a park nearby a school. And uh, the kids go to McDonald's and nobody cares. School don't get involved in that. Government doesn't get involved if you want to go eat at McDonald's. Well, these mothers started a nice home-cooked lunch for any student who wanted to come and eat lunch there, and they present a simple message of Christianity, and they feed the kids. Well, there's now 500 kids voluntarily coming to this. So now they're getting threatened. They're being told they have to stop it, that they can't do it. And thank God, these women are fighting and they've gotten a lawyer that will help them fight. So we cannot just kind of lay down under this and say, well, I don't know what to do. I mean, we need to get stirred up and say, we have got a right to talk about God as much as we want to talk about God. Now, I agree that this is a free country and we can't make people believe anything. And I don't personally think we should try to push off on anybody what we believe, but we should not let them take away what we believe. To be honest, it seems like today everybody's got rights but Christians. But everything that's going on in this country and many other countries around the world is because they have forgotten God. Boy, we sure need God when we're desperate. Well, you know, we can't just go to God when we're desperate. That's not a walk with God. Deuteronomy 8, 19, and 20. 
I figure we might as go out with a bang today. Amen. And if you forget the Lord, your God, listen, I don't want to forget God any day of my life. Now, you know, you grow in your walk with God, and I'm going to tell you a few things about my life, not doing any of it to brag, just as an example to you. I will not put my feet on the floor in the morning until I talk to God. I don't want to do that. I need him to get up and walk across the room. And you will too when you get old enough. Come on, Deuteronomy 8, 19. And if you forget the Lord your God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them. Now, you know, we think sometimes other gods is like being in some kind of false religion or bowing down to a, a statue of an idol. But let me tell you something. We can turn anything into a God in our life. Because anything that we make more important than God becomes an idol to us. You can let the building of a house come before God. Matter of fact, I know a man, him and his wife were building a home and he was very involved. He was a general contractor. And so in addition to his job, he was spending every waking moment with this house. During the building of that, he didn't have time to go to church. And it ended up causing some tremendous problems in his relationship with God, he ended up getting involved with another woman at work and got a divorce. We cannot afford to take a vacation from God. Amen. I know another woman who had this tremendous intercessory prayer ministry from God. And let me tell you something, when you can get up and pray four or five hours every morning, that's a gift. That is a gift. I pray a lot, but I don't have that gift. <laughs> and uh, she was very faithful and very diligent, and she was really enjoying it. And her family was going to take a two-week vacation, so she decided during those two weeks that she wouldn't get up early and pray. She never could go back to it after that. The anointing lifted, and she never could go back to it after that. You can't take a vacation from God. Hello, you cannot take a vacation from God. Well, you're not. I can tell when you guys are sure and when you're not. <laughs> you say, you mean to tell me that I need to spend time with God every day? How about like about every five minutes? God is not for the emergencies in our life. He is our life. <laughs> Are you awake out there? In him, Paul said, <laughs> Paul said, in him I live and move and have my being. Well, so we can just keep trying to do a bunch of stuff without him and just fail time after time and hopefully we'll finally get it. That's what happened to me. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 8, 19. And if you forget the Lord your God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. Verse 20. Like the nations which the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you perish because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. He's speaking to nations. Amen. God not only talks to individuals, but he talks to nations. Now, one of the saddest scriptures in the Bible is Jeremiah 2.32. It says, my people have forgotten me days without number. Wow. Just imagine for a second, if we could even remotely imagine being God for a second. And all you have is love for all these people that you sent your only son to die for. You love them so much that you gave up your only son and watched him die a horrible death. And now they don't even have time to say hi <laughs> for days without number. 
But I love the NET translation of Jeremiah 2.32. <laughs> Does a young woman forget to put on her jewels? Have you ever not put your earrings on and went back home to get them? <laughs> Look at that. I have too. Have you ever forgot your cell phone and went back home to get it? <laughs> Says, will a bride forget to put on her wedding dress? <laughs> But my people have forgotten me for more days than can even be counted. Okay, we said we'll go back home if we forget our earrings. We'll go back home if we forget our cell phone. But has anybody here ever forgotten to pray and thought, oh, I'm, I'm going back home to pray before I start this day? Amen. I'm not seeing any hands. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> this could possibly be the most valuable message that you have heard in a long, long time. And you know, then people say all this, well, you know, when I pray, I don't hear anything. When I try to study, I don't understand. I wouldn't even be concerned about that if I were you. I think the important thing to God is that you give him the time. I don't care if you just go sit in a chair somewhere and go, duh. I mean, surely you can say, I'm here because I can't make it through the day without you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Psalm 106, 7. Our fathers in Egypt understood not nor appreciated your miracles. They did not earnestly remember the multitude of your mercies nor imprint your loving kindness on their hearts, but they were rebellious and that provoked the Lord at the sea, even the Red Sea. So here's what happens. Forgetting God leads first to unbelief, and then it leads to rebellion. Well, I can see that clearly in our nation. When we started forgetting God, then we started to not believe, When I say we, I'm not talking about us as individuals. I'm talking about the we as a nation. For the life of me, I do not understand why if somebody doesn't want to believe in God, they think it's their mission to try to keep everybody else in the world from believing. I mean, that. this is like, what's going on in the world today is so clearly the devil. But he does have to find somebody to work through. Then it leads to rebellion. Now, that was my introduction. Now let's start the message. You know, we all have these turning points in our life. Places where you can say, man, when God revealed the meaning of that scripture to me, it was life changing. How many of you can remember some of those plateaus in your walk with God? See? And uh, one of those places for me was Psalm 27, verse 4. Because I was a born-again, spirit-filled preacher, and I was unhappy. <laughs> and to be honest, an unhappy Christian is kind of like an oxymoron. It's like... <laughs> that... <laughs> We ought to be the happiest people on the face of the earth. You know why? We're not going to hell. You say, well, I've got this problem and I've got that problem and I've got some other problem, but you're not going to hell. And even if you kept your silly problem for another 30, 40 years, however long you're going to live, Let me tell you something, if you have to keep putting up with it, you can put up with it if that's what you have to do. But you've got eternity, time without end. So come on now, let's just kind of get back our determination and say, I'm not going to float downstream with the rest of the world. I'm not going to lose my faith. I'm not going to not let God be first in my life. I want everything that God's got to give me. Amen? 
One thing have I asked of the Lord. While I was in that state of being unhappy, I really sincerely started seeking God. One thing have I asked of the Lord, and that will I seek, inquire for, and insistently require. The word seek is a very strong word. It means to crave, pursue, and go after with everything that you've got. You know how to seek a hot fudge sundae when you want one. <laughs> I am seeking a pair of shoes today when this conference is over. <laughs> I will find them. Matter of fact, I had a moment, I went in a shoe store the other day just to get a, uh, some insoles for my shoes that somebody had told me about. And I saw a couple pair of shoes right at the front door that I liked. And I have been planning that into my schedule ever since I saw them. Come on, I will get those shoes. I even tried one of your similar shoe stores here in town and they didn't have those shoes. So now I'm gonna go home from this conference where I have worked very hard and I'm gonna slip by that shoe store and I'm gonna get those shoes. I am seeking those shoes. I mean, come on, could we begin to seek God even like we do a pair of shoes? Could some of you guys get as excited about God as you do a football game? Just saying. Well, brother, I'm not going to go to church and act crazy like an emotional nut. Yeah? Well, I wish I had some video of you watching football. Wow! So, many years ago, God finally got this through to me, and he simply said this, Joyce, <laughs> you cannot do this, and by this he meant life, ministry, whatever your this is, we're talking about your this, rather your this is raising four kids. Rather, you're this as being a single parent. You cannot do this <laughs> unless you put God first in your life. And that scripture says we have to require him as a vital necessity in life. That means I can't do without him. Now, it, it matters very little to me if you think I'm being radical and overboard because I can tell you that I know that I would have no reason at all to even put my feet on the floor any day of my life if I didn't have God to serve. Amen. Now, some of you are still young enough that you think, oh man, I just, I gotta get married, I gotta have kids, I gotta climb the ladder of success, you know. <laughs> well, that's good, do all that. But if you do all that without God, you'll come to the end of it and you'll still be very dissatisfied. <laughs> You're going to be like a person roaming around in the wilderness, seeing one mirage after another that you think has got the water that you need. <laughs> well, this will make me happy. Well, this will make me happy. Well, this will make me happy. Nothing is going to make you happy, content, and satisfied. You may, you may go and enjoy a vacation, and you're happy while you're there, but who wants to just enjoy certain events and days in their life? I want to enjoy every single ordinary day of my life, every day, every moment. It's silly to say that we don't have time for God. And if we don't have time for him, that he's not first in our lives. Do you think about God and his goodness a fair amount in your life? Do you take time to thank God for your blessings, even little ones, that you can get out of bed and walk to the bathroom? That you do have clean water being pumped into your house, hot or cold? Do we thank God that somebody loves us? That we have somebody to eat with? A lot of people that are married think, well, you know, they're not happy and they want somebody else. And 
You know, there's probably some lonely woman that would take your guy if you really don't want him. <laughs> Might be happy just to have somebody to sit down and eat with. Can you say without hesitation that God is first in your life? Amen. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, the only Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be first in your own mind and your hearts. Deuteronomy 5, 7, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, so we want to seek God first. Now, the next first I want to talk to you about is seeking God's will first. I want to challenge you to really crave the will of God in your life. Your will be done, but not mine. That's an awesome prayer to pray that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, if you can remove this cup from me, please do. It kind of appears he didn't want to have to go through the death on the cross, but he quickly said, nevertheless. That's a good word. Nevertheless. It might go something like this for a single lady who's 50 and never been married. God, I just really want to get married. Nevertheless. I can be happy with just you. Your will be done. Lord, I really, really, really would love to have that promotion at work, and I feel like I've worked hard and I, I've earned it. Nevertheless, I can be happy without it, and I will be happy for whoever you give it to. Uh-oh, come on. We're diving in deep this morning. Nevertheless, Let's start putting a few more neverthelesses in our prayers. God wants to know what we want, but he also wants to know that it's not the basis of our joy. <laughs> well, I just don't think I can be happy without this. Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see how many weird noises we can make today. Seek ye first, aim at and strive after first of all his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right, and then all of these things will be added unto you. Don't you like added? Seek God's ways and he provides all other things. Live to please the Lord. Make decisions that are pleasing to God. Don't live to please yourself. Don't even live to please other people. <laughs> now, Paul did say that he made a lot of decisions in order to please other people so he would have an opportunity to lead them to Christ, but he wasn't talking about being a man pleaser. Some of you have allowed yourself to be manipulated and controlled by the whims and the desires of other people, and you have gotten yourself in a real mess because you're now in the middle of having to do a bunch of things that you don't even feel like is God for your life. Sounds like they need this over here more than you do, so I'm just going to stay over here a while. Well, so now you're in a fix. Well, what are you going to do? You know, if you confront the situation, you might lose the person or start a war. Well, one thing's for sure. You may have made a mistake that got you into this mess, but you cannot stay in it or your whole life will be destroyed because you let other people use you. Can I give you a piece of advice? You will not walk in the will of God unless you are willing occasionally 
to make somebody mad. And maybe I ought to say that to somebody else. I don't know. You know, we make a lot of decisions because we don't want people to be mad at us. And the problem is, is if they're going to get mad at you because you don't decide what they want, then they probably don't care that much about you anyway. I mean, that's really probably the truth. In the last five days, I've had to say no to three requests. Two of those requests came from fairly close friends. And it's not easy, but I was in that trap for too long. Well, can you do me a favor? Man, well, yeah, sure. But then I was killing myself physically. Still had to do what I needed to do to take care of this ministry because that was my main responsibility. If you don't learn to say no, you will never walk in the will of God. And if I tell somebody I don't feel like God really, well, I mean, what I said to the one girl, I mean, she had a great response. I said, you know what? I would love to come and help you and do that for you. But I gave her the reasons why. And I said, but it just wouldn't be a wise decision for me. And thankfully, she was spiritually mature enough to text me back and say, well, we would love to have you. And I'm disappointed, but wisdom has to trump everything else. Now that's a true friend and somebody that I might do something for at another time in life. You say, well, okay, I'm already in that mess. What am I supposed to do? Well, first thing you need to pray and see what God says to you about how to get yourself out of this situation. And then you may just have to sit down with the person and say, listen, I've got a confession to make. I have a problem and I'm insecure, and so because I want a relationship with you, I have done many things that you wanted me to do that I did not feel right about, and God is dealing with me about this, and I've got to make some changes. You know, the way to adjust anything is to just tell the truth. That doesn't mean they're going to like it. If they're not a believer, they certainly won't understand it. But you gotta break free from manipulation and control. We're gonna be led, guided, and controlled by the Holy Spirit, not by somebody else. Live to please the Lord. Colossians 1.10, that you may walk, live, and conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him and desiring to please him in all things. Ladies, I think we need to please God in the way we dress. You don't need to go to work and be a temptation to somebody else, especially not to somebody else's husband, amen? Well, I could just get off in a ditch here, and I've got a lot of things that I want to do, but. Okay, well, I'll just say it. We don't need selfies of you on Facebook in your bikini, thank you. I mean, really? Lord, help us. If you're going to wear something like that, get in your backyard with a high fence and stay put. Right? 
You say, well, you have no business telling me how to dress. Well, if you don't know how to dress, then I guess somebody needs to tell you. Let me tell you something, if something I've got on doesn't look right or it's to this or to that, Dave tells me. Hmm. All right. Colossians 3, 4 says that he is our very life. Whoa, I love that. All right. What else do I want to say to you here? Now, you know, there's a lot of other things in the Bible that say that if we do this first, then God will do that. They're all kind of related to the principle of sowing and reaping. You don't reap till you sow. <laughs> you can't. No farmer is going to get upset because he sowed no seed and now doesn't have a harvest. Mm-hmm. So, here's just a few I found in the Bible. Forgive others and you will be forgiven. Amen. Yep, that's a good one. Okay, now listen, you, we would be shocked to know how many people in this room today are mad at somebody. And you think you're justified in your anger. Well, we may get angry. The feeling of anger is not sin, but staying angry and acting on the anger is sin. This particular issue is doing more damage to the body of Christ as a whole and to the power that we should have as a church than any other single thing unforgiveness, Amen. bitterness, resentment. The Bible says, pray for your enemies and bless them. It doesn't say you have to like them. It doesn't say you have to have ooey gooey feelings when you get around them. Love is not a way we feel. It's a decision we make on how we're going to treat people and how we're going to talk about them. Amen. And my gosh, all the people watching on TV today. Lord have mercy. How many people are you mad at? Well. <laughs> you just. Let me tell you something. Being mad at somebody is not going to change them. It changes you. It doesn't change them. It changes you. It ruins your life. It poisons your life. Well, bless God, I'm just not going to let them get by with that. Well, God says if you will do things his way, he will be your vindicator. So do you want your brand of justice or God's? See, here again, back to last night's message. We go by feelings, but I feel, I feel, I feel. Well, get with God and pray until you can control those feelings. You're more than a feeling. Just because you feel something doesn't mean you have to be that way. Mark 11. For this reason, I'm telling you, whatever you ask for in prayer, we're talking prayer power here. Believe, trust, and be confident that it is granted to you and you will get it. Verse 25. And <laughs> whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, oh my gosh, anything against anyone, anything against anyone, anything, little things, big things, things that you think you're justified in, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him and let it drop, leave it and let it go. Pray 
for the person, put them in God's hands, walk away from the hatred, the bitterness, the resentment, and get about living your life. Okay, listen, in order <laughs> that your father also would forgive you your own failings and shortcomings. You know, millions of people pray the Lord's Prayer and they don't even understand what they're praying. Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. <laughs> Do we really want God to forgive us the same way we forgive other people? Boy, this is time well spent today. Be merciful first, and then you will receive mercy. My, my. See, when you sow a good seed, you're not only likely to get a harvest from God, but you'll also get a harvest from people. I believe if because we love God, we show mercy to people, and mercy always goes to people who don't deserve it. That's what mercy is. <laughs> mercy is kindness beyond anything that's even reasonable. So if you're waiting to find somebody that deserves mercy, you've got the whole wrong idea about mercy. Mercy is given to somebody who has not done what is right, And you decide to just cut them a break. Maybe you decide to believe the best or to just drop it and let it go. How many times do you have to mention to your husband that he left his socks on the floor again? <laughs> you could be merciful and pick them up and then see what God does for you. Okay, moving on. I don't want to get too personal here. <laughs> yeah, God has dealt with me even about things like that. Joyce, do you have to just keep mentioning it? <laughs> See, even if we forgive somebody, we want to mention to them that we did forgive them. <laughs> Are you there? Yeah. We don't want anybody to think they got by with anything. If I'm going to be merciful, you're going to know I'm merciful, and you are going to appreciate my mercy. Oh, boy, it is so hard to just do what's right and keep your mouth shut. Now, here's something else the Bible tells us, which is pretty valuable. It's another first. Don't ignore your own faults while pointing out the faults of others. Really? Are you trying to tell me that I have more wrong with me than the person I'm criticizing? <laughs> Matthew 7, 5, you hypocrite. <laughs> first. Everybody say first. First, get the beam of timber out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the tiny speck out of your brother's eye. Oh, my. Let him who is without sin among you cast the first stone. Only those who are perfected <laughs> should criticize anybody else. Mm. Man, you guys are making me tired. <laughs> First. <laughs> Humble yourself under the mighty hand and then God will help you. <laughs> Pray first, and then you will receive. Don't plan first, and then when you're out in the middle of doing what you want to do, pray for God to make it work. No, first we pray about everything, 
acknowledging God in all of our ways and he will direct our path. First, give first and then you will receive. Hmm, where were the claps on that for goodness sakes? You don't have to get nervous, we've already received the offering. Luke 6, 38, give and gifts will be given unto you. <laughs> Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will men give back into your bosom. For with the same measure you use when you deal out to others, it will be dealt back to you again. First, Malachi 3, 10 and 11, bring all the tithe, the whole tenth of your income into the storehouse. <laughs> Woo. That's all the tithers that are clapping, by the way. <laughs> that there may be food in my house and prove me now by it. God is saying, I dare you to start tithing and bringing offerings. Let's see what I'll do for you. You say, well, wait a minute. I, tithing is under the law. That's Old Testament. <laughs> okay, well, boy, I got a good answer for that. You want to hear my answer? Even if it was under the law and they were giving 10%, what in the world should we be doing by grace? <laughs> okay, you wanna say tithing is under the law? Then why don't you just forget 10% and do 20? <laughs> Breathe, we got five more minutes. Bring all the tithe, the whole tenth of your income into the storehouse that there might be food in my house and prove me now by it, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not, after you have first done this, open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so great that you will not be able to contain it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. The little boy gave his lunch, the last that he had, and went home with 12 baskets full of leftovers. There's nothing that says the little boy took them home, but I believe Jesus gave them to him. That's all right, God. You are much greater than I am. I'll give you my little bit if you'll give me your leftovers. How many of you would be happy with God's leftovers? Yeah. Just throw me a little leftovers. <laughs> Obey first. And then experience radical, outrageous blessings in your life. Are you there? Obey first and then experience radical, outrageous blessings in your life. Believe first and then you will receive. Well, I'm not gonna believe it unless I can see it. Well, then you'll never see it. Because that's the way God's economy is. First, you believe in your heart and you keep a good confession while you're waiting. And then boy, suddenly, All of a sudden, you can shout and holler, it works, it works, it works, it works, it works. Well, now let's remember that we are to be led, guided, and controlled by the Holy Spirit. And my prayer for all of us today is that as we seek Him, He will help us keep God first in everything that we do. Today we're offering you the, our study Bible, the Everyday Life Study Bible, and we have it in a color that I think is just gorgeous. It's fuchsia, and I'm sure a lot of you, especially the ladies, are going to really want to get this. You can never have too many Bibles, and we're offering you with it a free journal. A lot of you have written in and shared just how much you enjoy this study Bible, like William, who says this, I use the Everyday Life Study Bible every day as I watch the program. 
and I also read it every day. It helps me understand the Bible better, and it's bringing me back to God. Thank you so much. If you don't have our study Bible yet, I think you're really going to enjoy it. So get your copy today. 